Welcome to Shaping the New York City Skyline, the podcast that explores the stories behind the buildings that shape our city. I'm your host, Brenda Slokowski, and I'm here with my co-host, David Shamshovich. Hey, guys. Hello, Brenda and Camilla, and hello to all those who took the Skyline Express down to the Shaping the New York City Skyline podcast. Welcome, Welcome to our bonus, bonus episode. episode. Another bonus episode. Oh, what's... I can't believe it. I just, I just turned my head. There was a bonus episode. Such a pleasure to be back in the studio. Uh, you know, we have some really special guests. Two gentlemen. A first ever. A first ever. Returning guest. Returning guest. This is, this is a, an unprecedented moment for me to see uh, the one and only Jason, the G- 421i Jedi Hershkowitz. And sitting to his immediate right, which you wouldn't know because there are no cameras on us, is his apprentice, Scott the 421A Schreiber. I like that you gave him his middle name as 421A. <laughs> it should be really be no, 485S. His parents gave him the middle name. <laughs> no, you're right, you're right. You were basically born to do tax exemptions. Yeah, that's Although, right. Although, you can start life. that way, uh, but... It's a process. It's a process, and you've really leaned into it, I feel. But you know what? It's bonus episode. We're not going to ask you what school you went to. Right. We're we don't not, really care about your background, Scott. <laughs> we don't care what your blood type is. Uh, what we care about is to get right down to it. 421A. Jason, you have the scoop. What's going on? Give us the scoop. You know what? Multiple scoops. It, it would be my pleasure. And it's also my pleasure to be the first returning guest. I feel honored. <laughs> uh, so 421A, hopefully soon to be called 485X. Hopefully. The governor has submitted a new proposal for a new program that is in some ways like the 421A we know and love, Affordable New York, but in some ways different. So we are here, Scott and myself, to go over some of the similarities and the differences with this new program, which is not in effect, but has been proposed by the governor. And is there anything that we can interpret from the fact that there's even been a proposal this time around? Well, I hope that what this means is that there are discussions ongoing and that we can look to, in the near future, something actually happening to get development back up to speed in New York City. I like to take this as an indication that the city and the state have seen the number of affordable housing applications or housing applications in general and said, oh, no, we need to do something. All right. Yeah, I agree. I think if they look at the numbers, I think it's pretty obvious that something like this is needed. So it's in, it's a first step in the right direction. So let's just dive right into it. Good job, legislature. No, I good job, Kathy. Brenda is super excited even before we know exactly. I want to know exactly what this thing has in store for us. Well, you? I just had lunch, so it was a good time to catch me. So as a starting point, the program is set up to be pretty similar to the Affordable New York Housing Program. The nuts and bolts and the skeleton of the program are, are pretty similar, but there are some differences some of which we know, some of which we don't know yet. So the first thing I do want to point out is that unlike Affordable New York, which when the state passed the statute, they set forth various options as far as um, affordability percentages and projects and what AMI levels and income levels would be required. The proposal here will leave it up to New York City and the Department of Housing, Preservation and Development to set forth what some of those standards will be in rules that they will promulgate following the passing of this statute. So we don't know how many affordable units projects we'll need. We don't know what AMI levels those projects will need them at. Obviously, we know that those will exist, and we just don't know the levels yet. Is that how the prior program, the one that expired, was done as well, or were the AMIs already baked in? No, everything in the history of the 421A, the the various iterations of 421A, it was baked into the state statute. So this would be the first time that anything really is being left up to HPD anything like that. Wow, double unprecedented times. Well, I have an idea as to why that is, but do you think you have an an understanding as to why that she did it that way, the governor? I don't have any actual knowledge, but my assumption is that it really is New York City and HPD who deal with affordable housing and New York City housing on a daily basis. And at least for my personal opinion is that they are in a, a much better position to judge what the city needs in order to spur development and, and increase the affordable housing stock and the, the, you know, the market rate housing stock as well. So it makes sense to me that it would be left in the hands of the people who know more. Yeah. So do you think that, I mean, the assumption is that these levels will be based program-wide, but 
Do you think that there's a chance that they would do program wide based on area now that you're saying it that way? I mean, certainly all the statute says is that it'll be pursuant to rules promulgated by HPD. So I think, you know, is there a chance that things go area wide? Yeah. Uh, specific areas? Yes. But historically, I, that's not what they've done. And yeah. I, I wouldn't think that that is the likely, although we can't say. Right. I'm kind of thinking of MIH options in yeah. that area. Well, I, I, there are likely to be different options. The statute, what the statute does do in the statute is differentiate between small rental projects and large rental projects. They draw the line at 30 units, which to me is a, is a low number, but that's where they draw the line. So there will be different requirements for small projects and larger projects. So that's a little that. similar to how the now expired 421A dealt with condos, right? It had to be, is it 30 units and it then was, a certain- That's correct. It was, it was 35 units 35 or, units. or fewer could apply for the home ownership option. But that also leads to another great point, whereas the proposal appears to expand the home ownership option, where they don't have a, a building size limit in this case. It looks like if this goes forward, the home ownership option and the eligibility will be much more similar to rental projects in that a specific percentage of the units in that project will need to be affordable at specified levels in order to qualify. The previous program had not only a building size limit, but it was based upon the assessed value of the project after it completed construction, which really at the end of the day, besides kind of having nothing to do with affordable housing, also left you with uncertainty. You didn't know when you started a project what your assessed value would be at the end of the day. So it wasn't a lock that you would get 421A, which is, was certainly different than every other version of 421A in the past. So this seems to bring that back to the normal 421A structure, which is do X, Y, and Z have affordable number of units at this level, and you'll get benefits. So let's just take this hypothetical. This gets presented before the legislature. And I think you were right on, on point that the New York City agency, HPD, is in the best position. But I want to take it a step farther. I think that the 130% AMI in the prior program is really what the legislature did not like. And if they don't propose an AMI level, then they're giving them very little room to be against it because we don't know what those levels are and they're leaving it to government. So I think it's a tactically, I think it's she's done that specifically, but that's just, again, opinion, conjecture. Go, Kathy. <laughs> that's right. So it goes to the legislature, they pass it. Now what happens? What's the next step here? Sure. So not only will we need HPD to promulgate rules to determine percentage of units and AMIs, but there's one other step that we need, and that's what's referred to in the statute as an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, between what will effectively be REVNI, Real Estate Board of New York, and the construction unions to come up with the minimum average hourly wage that must be paid to construction workers for 420 projects, not only the wage, but the size of projects to which that will be applicable and the areas to which that will be applicable. That also is not spelled out in the statute and will be left up to those two um, parties to decide later on. And how did that transpire in the, in the prior iteration of the program? Sure. So actually that held up Affordable New York, the Affordable New York housing program for quite some time as well, where after that statute was passed by the legislature and, and signed by the governor back in 2015, it took almost two years for 421A, the Affordable New York Housing Program, to actually take effect while this discussion about the minimum average hourly wage was ongoing. And at the end of the day, that program specified certain areas, most of Manhattan and some of Brooklyn and Queens that was closest to the waterfront and for projects of 300 units or more. That's where the prior program, that's where they came out. We don't know if this one will expand the areas. I highly doubt they'll you know, decrease the areas. But you know, will it still be 300 unit projects or greater? Or, you know, will we see something like 100 units, 150? We don't know, you know, the extent to the projects that will be out there. And once they make that commitment or they've negotiated that out, are these promulgated somewhere? So the last time it ended up getting baked into the statute. So whether or not they'll put it into the statute or whether or not it'll refer to the MOU or whether it will be in rules I guess we'll see, but it will be up to those parties to, to shape a lot of what's to happen here in 485X. Kind of going linear, how does the MWE aspect play in as compared to the prior program? Right. So the prior program had no minority or women-owned business enterprise requirements, oh, enterprise. MWE requirements. This, for the first time, we'll put that into a 421A context. It's proposing that 25% of the construction contracts, you know, a basically a good faith effort be made to give... 25% of the construction contracts to MWBEs. MWBE compliance is something that we here at Sign and Shine are very familiar with. We deal with it in other programs. The ICAP program has an MWBE component. 
the ESD Gowanus pilot program that our last bonus episode that I was a part of dealt with had an MWBE component. So it's something that is we're familiar with. It's certainly growing in city and state programs. So it really comes at no surprise that they would try to put something yeah. in, into this one as well. And I think most of our clients and the developers that we deal with, like I said, they've dealt with this before. So I, I don't think anybody is surprised to see something like that added. And Scott, why is it that you think that the MWB was such, because this seems to be pretty much the only change, right? Or the biggest change, I would think. Was it proposed in the prior iteration that when it was called 485W? No, it wasn't proposed in 485W. So why do you think it was such an important thing for it to be introduced here? Was it another sort of convincing, try to convince the legislature to pass it? Is it another bone that they're throwing? Because this seems to be very important. It was incorporated in ICAP, and it seems to be something that's very important to the city. So why do you, is, is there a reason you, that that was introduced? And how do you comply with that requirement in the programs that you work with? so that it juxtaposes to what's going to be necessary for this new program if it comes into effect. I think you're right on that it's a way of getting more legislators to sign off on the bill. I mean, I don't know, but that would be my... We're here to speculate. We don't know. We almost don't know. We know what the governor has written down, but yeah, we're speculating on a lot of these things. But guess what? We're on the front lines. So you probably want us to speculate more than uh, some Joe Schmo. So I'd I'd love to hear what, what your thoughts are. I mean, keep in mind, like I was saying, the ESD program that the governor also just introduced also had an MWB component to it. So, you know, again, it just seems that that's the way the city and the state are going. This is what they want. And so I think that's why that's one of the reasons why it was added here. I think certainly having an MWB component will expand, you know, the support for the bill. And really, at the end of the day, as we've seen through the history of the ICAP program and other programs, you know, there is good to be done when some of these MWBE contractors get exposure. Some of the the local contractors get exposure. And I think that's only really a good thing for, you know, citywide development and these programs. And I think it's a good thing to be included. And if you're a developer out there who needs help with your MWBE stuff. Side and shine is here to help you. That's right. We have a whole team of uh, attorneys who work on this stuff on a day-to-day basis. Obviously, we're familiar with it from an ICAP perspective. We can work on it from this new 458X. It's going to be hard for me to 485X with my, um, what is it called, with uh, (laughs) dyslexia, (laughs) which I don't have because I don't think I would be able to pass the bar. But is there anything else of note here that you can provide our Skyliners who you so, so kindly named? I do have one interesting tidbit, tidbit, which is yet to be resolved. And that is with respect to rent stabilization of market rate units. So when the Affordable New York Housing Program first came out, it clearly provided an exemption from rent stabilization for market rate units that were rented above what at that time was called the the high uh, high rent high rent, deregulation. High rent vacancy deregulation threshold. <laughs> well, what a mouthful! Yeah, it's now called the market rate threshold. Thank God. <laughs> but what ended up happening in 2019 with the Rent Act of 2019, when the city and state, really the state, adjusted to a lot of the rent stabilization laws is they removed this high rent vacancy deregulation. And that left an unknown with 421A and Affordable New York because the way the statute was written was essentially, without getting into too many details, was uh, our market rate unit is stabilized unless it is eligible to be exempt from high rent vacancy deregulation. Well, if high rent vacancy deregulation no longer existed, you can't be exempt from it. Yeah. So, but they, the legislature quickly realized its mistake, went back and adjusted the Rent Act of 2019 to say, okay, there's no more high rent vacancy deregulation except for 421A Section 16, which is the section that created Affordable New York. 485X has the same language where market rate units are rent stabilized unless they're exempt pursuant to high rent vacancy deregulation. Well, there's no high rent vacancy deregulation that would pertain to 485X. So in order for that to be applicable, there would have to be some more amendments to the rent stabilization law to also exempt units under this program. I'm assuming somebody started with a draft of a prior, (laughs) yeah, and then they just forgot to delete that language. Right, there there was a find and replace error right there. (laughs) You're writing a letter to like Mr. Smith, and and then you're like, dear Mr. Williams. (laughs) It's like, I just forgot to to delete it. And uh, you're always very informative. You have so much information, you're really on the top of your game, and at the cusp of everything that's awesome in the 421A land. Is there anything else that uh, you can tell our Skyliners? 
No. Uh, no. That was a smirk. <laughs> I feel like you have more to say. <laughs> no, no. Um, not about 485X. What about? I, I, <laughs> Are you going to make an announcement here? Are you pregnant? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> we can't lose it now that we're getting a new 428.5X. No, you nailed it. That was it for whatever you just said. Yeah. The new T1000. <laughs> Is that a calculator? <laughs> We'll keep all of our listeners informed as we learn more and as this bill makes its way through, you know, the process. We'll keep everyone informed when we hear more, when changes are made, and when there's more to report. Stay tuned, Skyliners, and make sure to subscribe so you get all of our announcements. That's right. Jason, Scott, we love you so much. And Thanks we cannot do our, literally, we cannot do our jobs without you because inclusionary housing and mandatory inclusionary housing and 421 air are like peanut butter and jelly. And you don't want your mouth to be too dry because then you're going to... Want some milk and then who like wants cereal and milk, like cereal they just and milk, go so well together. Yeah, you can do one without the other, but it's just a such a good combo. <laughs> what Brent is trying to say, other than uh, doing her like Godfather like right. voice, is that the inclusionary housing group comprised of uh, Camilla, Brent, and myself, Jason, Scott, and others that work with them in tax incentives work very closely together because it's part of those housing incentives that a lot of developers will use. Together. Now, you can't, not every project is inclusionary housing or mandatory because of specific areas, but every time you have an MIHRIH, yeah. you always have some level of tax exemption. I think it's very important to point out what you're saying that inclusionary housing was enacted with the understanding that those projects or most of those projects will also be getting a 421A exemption. So that's, you know, another vital reason why we need something like 485X to pass so that these inclusionary housing projects will also. Uh, go forward. And thankfully, we have you guys here to explain it to us. I did just think of one other t- one other thing, though. <laughs> Under 45X, the affordable housing for large rental projects will be required to be affordable permanently as well. Oh, that's a big change. Yeah. Unlike the previous program where after 35 years, you could remove the affordability component or the rent stabilization component. Larger projects will now have a permanent. Doubly uh, glad we still have you here to explain. Well, I mean, it depends on the developer's perspective as to whether they're really thinking 35 years ahead. But for inclusionary housing and MIH projects that have a 428 or 45X component, so that right this yeah, time? Yeah, you did it. Um, Good job. They, it's not, <laughs> it's not going to matter as much because they're essentially going to be affordable for life anyhow. Uh, Jason, Scott, you are a well of information. Thank you so much. We'll keep you guys entertained and informed as this news breaks. And uh, please subscribe and feel free to reach out to Jason or Scott at their email addresses. And you can look us up on signshine.com to get that info. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Bye. Well, everyone, that's our show. Thanks so much for listening. And of course, don't forget to subscribe. Also, don't forget to leave comments because we love to hear from our audience. Right, Brenda? Yeah. Feel free to reach out at info at sideandshine.com or visit our website at sideandshine.com. We really look forward to hearing from you. You could also reach out to David and Brenda at dshamshovich at sideandshine.com and bslikowski at sideandshine.com. Those are lengthy last names. You can just find us on our website. That's right. (laughs) 